Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know, their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff hope you enjoy it please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy pippa welcome to the podcast thank you lewis thank you for having me pleasure or well, video cast actually most of them yeah are exactly now, sadly but... we're not in the studio <laughs> no next time next time for those that don't know yeah. you you are a partner at sweet capital yes that awesome. is correct. and how how's the last few months been how have the last few months been? I mean, how have they been for everyone? I think that it's been a very strange period of adjustment. Um, so yeah, so look, I feel like I've been isolating since early March. So I'm I'm entering my fifth month of lockdown now. So I'm a pro. I'm a complete That's pro. Crazy. How how is your how have your habits changed? I mean, obviously your routine's completely different, presumably to what it was before. Or have you always yeah. been working remotely and yeah, the funny thing is, is that so um, we can get into a little bit about what I do, but <clears throat> my my job is very much, you know, uh, suited to to remote work. Um, often we are, I mean, I spend a lot of time typically between the US and the UK. Obviously, that isn't happening at the moment, but I'm quite used to taking, you know, video calls or or meeting people virtually. I think what's been difficult is that a lot of my job is meeting entrepreneurs meeting people in business and you know a lot of that just happens in person so yeah. there was definitely a bit of a, a transition period where everyone started moving those meetings online and luckily for us you know versus some other funds who you know say oh, we've got to meet a person in uh, a person you know in person before we invest for us yeah. we were a bit more used to that you know virtual getting to know you um yeah. but that's, yeah oh, that's cool so so you've always worked from home or virtually and it's not really we, we have an office we definitely have we have an office space that we 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 work out of but given that you know often the team are on the road we are fairly used to having to to cope with people in lots of different places um yeah. but it hasn't been too tough from that perspective i think what has been difficult is obviously working with a lot of entrepreneurs who are seeing real disruption to their business and part of my job is to be really close to them and, and support them so i definitely haven't uh escaped the the impacts of covid and, and yeah. certainly you know a lot of the founders we have worked with some of them have had real impacts to their business yeah, I'm sure. um, yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been very variable. I mean, it's I think it widely accepted as the worst economy ever. It's just it's affected different industries differently and different businesses differently. And some people have been able to pivot quicker or better than others. And yeah. it's been it's been quite um it's been quite a varied story I found for mm. for everyone. Um, yeah. Have you have you been working quite closely then with the entrepreneurs and and companies that you've invested in? Has that been the kind yeah, of yeah? No, of course. Look, I'd say my job mostly falls into two parts. One is finding new uh, companies to invest in and meeting with those new entrepreneurs. But then a lot of it is supporting the existing portfolio. Um, but during that initial period, there was this sort of triage of everyone, all venture capital funds, looking, you know, internally and saying, okay, what of the existing investments that we've already made need our help? You know, yeah. some needed needed to furlough staff, some needed to raise another bridge round a lot we're trying to navigate some of the initiatives coming out of the treasury so i'd say that you know new investments definitely took a bit of a hit through through march and early april because everyone was just focused on making sure that their existing investments were going to be okay so, yeah yeah what, what a crazy learning experience yeah yeah i mean um you say to founders you've got to be prepared for the unpredictable but yeah. global yeah. pandemic it really uh really was a, a bit of a black swan this year oh yeah so. I, I remember kind of the january 2020 we just have we just had the well maybe just before we had the election in the uk and yeah. then all the brexit stuff which was talked about for like god knows how long yeah. um, felt like it was kind of coming to an end one way or another yeah and then and then february comes and then this all of this stuff hits and it's it's uh it's been relentless really 2020 has, been. has been mad i mean if you think about it as well the beginning of 2020 the you know 
Australian bushfires were, you know, the whole yeah. Australia was burning down and, and, and that feels so long ago now, but actually there has been so much which has crept into 2020 um, yeah. that it's, yeah, it's got to roll, roll with the punches, basically. Yeah. Um, so how did, you, how did you start out in, in venture capital? Yeah, so it's a funny question because, I mean, people do ask me this and I would say that there is not a particular path to, to venture capital in general. It tends to be um, a path that, you know, is, is fairly unique for everyone. And I think that as a result, VC funds also hire quite sporadically. It's not like a, um, perhaps an industry that has more seasoned hiring cycles, etc. So it also lends itself to people coming from lots of different backgrounds. So, I mean, actually, if I go back to, to, to myself, when I first graduated undergrad, I thought I was going to become a diplomat. Uh, I'd studied Chinese and I'd, I'd worked at the embassy, the British embassy in Beijing. And my first kind of work experience was going out and working at the foreign office. And I loved, I loved it. Uh, it was, it was, it was so interesting. And I got to use my Chinese and, and I'm half Chinese. So it was, it was fun spending time there, but you know, I'd really grown up with a dad who has been a lifelong entrepreneur. And I think part of me was always just really curious about getting into the kind of either startup world or business world. So yeah. I actually ended up leaving to go and take up a place on a graduate recruitment scheme um, where I wanted to basically get some just, you know, basic financial analysis skills. So I ended up going to JP Morgan, uh, really enjoyed it, Spent ended up spending five years there, which I, I didn't expect, got to work in London, got to move to Hong Kong. And when I was in Hong Kong, I was, you know, spending time looking at uh, the Chinese market, you know, what were consumer trends there, what were the technology trends there, and it was just this amazing time of growth and development. Um, so, so ended up staying longer than I thought that I would, and and then basically, you know, so still not in VC, I um, I decided I didn't want to become a public equities fund manager. So I thought, you know, let's go off, apply for an MBA, and spend two years kind of testing out different things, trying out um, different. You know, listening to other people about their career paths yeah. and, and it was really during that MBA that I kind of fell into this you know yeah. entrepreneurial ecosystem oh, and where did you do the MBA? I went to Harvard so I went to the US for two okay. years is that the first and time you, you'd lived in in the US it was so I'd I'd um I'd gone to the US a bunch of times with work and you know, I'd worked for an American bank. So I'd done things like trainings there and I'd, I'd interned there when I was younger. But it was my first time actually living and breathing in you know, the US, in US culture. And, and I was yeah. there at you know, quite an interesting time culturally and politically because it was I arrived just before Donald Trump's election in 2015. Right. <laughs> uh, so that was interesting. And, uh, uh, and then I spent two years basically um, you know, and I, I say to people, there's no one needs to have an MBA. And I think if you do do one, it's important to be really mindful about why you're doing it. And for me, it was just, I was really nosy. I wanted to know what other people were doing. I wanted to try out different things. So, yeah. you know, I interned at a few kind of startups, worked for one called Glossier, which a friend of mine had been the first employee at. And I kind of got the, I guess, the bug for uh, working in the startup world during the MBA, um, which kind of led the path towards ending up uh -huh. in DC. How how different did you find it from working at JP Morgan? Because it, it, on the face of it, they seem poles apart. Venture capital, you mean? Yeah. So, yeah. well, JP Morgan being a huge financial institution. Yeah. MBA, VC, working with entrepreneurs. So, is it is it as different as it seems, or? Yeah, there... it is. The short answer is yes. <laughs> um, there, look, there are definitely things that I really learnt um, during the time working at someone like JP Morgan that are definitely transferable. So I, I often use this analogy um, of, you know, when you're investing in a company, it's about picking the right race, it's picking about the right horse and then the right jockey. And what I found that my, my job at JP Morgan was really good at setting the scene of like the macro, like the industry, like what are the, the wider trends in, in the global economy that are really interesting, like technology, like consumer. And, um, but a lot of what you're spending your time on in venture capital is, you know, why is it that horse and that jockey? It's a lot more about the founder. You know, I was in, you know, yeah. when I was working at JP Morgan, I was working with huge companies. I was investing, saying like, you know, 
you should invest in Amazon or Google or Tencent. And uh, now it's, you know, it's often the, the founder alone with pitch deck and uh and you're at the very beginning of that journey and you're you're basically getting to know their story and understanding why they're the right jockey and they've got the right horse to win the race so it's your complete polar opposite ends uh of the game really so you're just you're just so you're really you're really backing the founder yeah so the business idea might be great the sector's interesting the dynamics are there but it's that is it that chemistry that you're trying to assess it's you know it's less about my chemistry with the founder. I think it's important that you obviously do um, you form a rapport and they're someone that you they want to work with. Uh, sorry, you're someone that they want to work with. Yeah. Um, but the reason I really, especially, so we we work at the seed stage. So you're really we're sometimes the first investment the company yeah. makes. Think like dragons then, basically. Yeah. Um, the the reason that the founder is so important is that at the very early stage your defensibility versus the next person coming along and and doing the same idea is quite low. So it's really down to, you know, why is it this individual who will be able to execute this idea better than the next person? Because, you know, you you haven't yet built this defensibility. You haven't built this kind of moat, as they call it, around you. So it's really down to, you know, can this individual do it the best and the quickest? Crazy. Yeah. And you're you're focusing on technology consumer. Yes, so it's so my, the the fund suite to give you a bit of context is, uh, it's it was founded by the founders of King.com, who are most well known for creating Candy Crush, the yeah. well known game. So they sold it for around six billion dollars, uh, in two thousand fifteen, which I think sometimes shocks people. Right. Uh, Candy Crush is, is so valuable, it's and uh, it was an incredible, incredible well. game. <laughs> yeah, look, they. I think that I think their investors were, yeah. were obviously quite happy with that. Um, and, and the founders, when they they took some exits from from the sale, decided that actually they wanted to use their money to to put it back into the entrepreneurial ecosystem and invest in upcoming entrepreneurs who were going through what they've been going through you know, twenty years before. Um, yeah. So so over time, we've just really decided that the place that we can be most helpful is in the areas that they know the best so that's technology obviously um it's things around consumer technology so think of things like social networks or um you know anything that has like i guess a consumer touch point as opposed to something that's just very deep tech or healthcare that's working in the background um so yeah consumer technology and did that that fitted your interests well yeah, you know, for me, it was great because I'd already been focused on the consumer sector and the yeah. technology sector. Even when I was at JP Morgan, I spent time looking at, as I mentioned, companies like Tencent, Alibaba, yeah. Baidu. And these are really the giants of the Chinese uh, tech economy. And yeah. I would spent a lot of time looking at what trends were were happening in, in China and and then obviously in the US when I was when I was there for my MBA. And so then when I came back to London in 2018, started working with Sweet, it was like this, it was a great kind of full circle um, to come and look at technology in Europe um, and obviously the US because we still do invest in the US as well. Yeah. And have you found that given your knowledge of the consumer trends in China mm. uh, or maybe Asia more broadly, the US, is, is London following suit? Are there, are there diff- like differences? How have you? Yeah, look, I think definitely. Um, I think that it's the, specifically the Chinese ecosystem and I, let's call it the the US and European ecosystem. They're just they're quite different. Um, and I think that that's partly because if you look at China, a lot of the consumers there really grew up without a broad offline uh, infrastructure. You know, we talk about here like, you know, the high street has existed for a long time. And how can we migrate people from the high street online? China yeah. didn't have a high street. Uh, so if you think about it, like the, the generation in mainland China that's growing up now really grew up with e-commerce. You know, yeah. it's an immense, obviously it's a huge country and a lot of um, a lot of customers or, or people were, were in these quite isolated rural communities. So their real first interaction with commerce at scale has been through the likes of, you know, an Alibaba or uh, like a JD, which basically your, your e-commerce staples there. Yeah. So I think that as a result, you've got just quite a different consumer um, behavior. So things in China that are actually further ahead uh, than, than say Europe and US are things like e-commerce is, is similar because I think Amazon is obviously 
very pre prevalent, but yeah. things like uh, financial payments, uh, all of those systems, like the Chinese consumers are very used to to operating digitally, whereas, you know, the UK, Europe and, and the US, we just had a much more robust offline infrastructure that takes a bit longer to, to shift over. So Definitely. that's one thing that I find to be quite yeah. interesting. So here, yeah, here it's like, it's quite like, it's it's a nice thing to go shopping and a lot of people like to go buy things face to face. Yeah. But given, given COVID, I mean, that's completely been shut. And yeah. a lot, you know, you've been forced to go online now. Um, which is interesting. And that trend was coming, obviously, anyway, but it's just had a big kind of shot in the arm. And Yeah, I think that there's been an emphasis for a while in retail about moving towards the experiential and really making those offline experiences special uh, and differentiated from from purely online. But then obviously COVID came along. And and what's interesting, I think I said this to you before, but it takes around 60 days, research says, for a habit to become automatic. And we're in what, like close to 100 now. Yeah. So so you have the impact on the consumer side of people getting used to, you know, whatever these COVID new consumer trends are, whether it be working from home, whether it be shopping from home, whether it be working out at home. Yeah. Um, and then on the retail side, you also have some kind of structural triggers that have come in. So a lot of, and we were talking about before, um, you know, some shops have been forced to actually permanently close down their offline stores and gravitate a lot of their sales online. Now, you know, if all the, the, the country opens up um, as it hopefully will soon, some of those things just won't be able to come back online straight away, you know, as yeah. in you know, some of those shops have been closed permanently. So I think actually, a lot of the consumer behaviors that we're seeing coming in now are going to be quite enduring in a way yeah. that initially I didn't expect. I thought that people would just go back to normal, but yeah. you know, you're seeing people actually get used to, to life now. So it's yeah. really interesting. Would, would you, do you prefer to go to a shop and buy your clothes versus online? Like when everything's kind of like said and done, what would your go-to be now? Do, do you know what? I, I like shopping online and I, I think it depends a little bit. I think that um, people like shopping online for particular items and offline for other things like, I don't know, something like shoes probably or footwear. People, yeah. you know, still want to to try in person, but I I, I can't, I prefer online. I'm a big yeah. e-commerce convert. I like online. We get all our food online. I've really enjoyed yeah. the gym, the gym online now as well. Yeah. I've, I've really got into and I've, yeah. upped my game. I've upped my game as well now. So I'm doing more day. <laughs> That's the thing my... is that it's that was exactly one of the trends. So when all of this started happening and as you know, my job is to really stay on top of what what are the interesting consumer trends that are happening at any given time, but particularly in COVID. So what I did was I started looking to the Chinese market. They've got what three months extra hindsight, not that yeah. much more, but a bit. And and I looked at what has actually stayed in place. And what has has gone away and i was amazed that a lot of these trends especially ones like fitness at home yeah people were still continuing even after they could go to normal gyms yeah interesting i can yeah. see that i've i got i luckily got well my, my gym are kind enough to lend me equipment and so there you go. and they went online and me and my wife have been doing it together on like in in the garden on you know on the thing because we've got a couple of kids it's been really difficult to you know she likes to exercise and I like to exercise so you have to yeah. take it and now it's just you know we can do it together we can and, there's, do it you know, and there's an accountability to it as well because my sister as well she's been arranging yeah. she's arranged zoom workouts for us every week and there is that accountability as well which <laughs> yeah. makes sure that you actually do attend yeah. these sessions because oh, come on the family. yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's, great. It's, it's super interesting how, how have how have your portfolio companies been affected by COVID so uh, look I'd say two things there are some companies in our portfolio which have been really exposed to just you know one of them is very reliant on tourism and travel so you know that that company needed to basically you know unfortunately furlough a few people and extend their runway to basically save so so that company has um I, I suppose kind of been on hold and working on a lot of the product. So that's yeah. what a lot of companies are doing at the moment. If you can't go out and make sales, you're working on kind of internal processes and saying, okay, how can we come out of this in a better position than where, where we yeah. started? And then um, the other thing about our portfolio, I'd say is that because of our background in gaming and our 
or investments around consumer technology, some of them have actually had a you know their busiest times ever. So really? if you, yeah, if you look at um, you know how much all of us are needing to spend uh, screen time on our phones and our laptops and you know, obviously that isn't necessarily always a great thing, but for some of our companies who are say social networks, um, we're invested in a company called Peanut, which is a social network for mums originally. Now it's extended to, to you know, women across all different stages of life. Um, but for them, they've seen their highest engagement ever because suddenly, you know, mums need to connect virtually in a way that they didn't before. Um, and they've just introduced a video chat on the, on, the company's social network because they they realized that people were just hungry to go and meet face to face or you can't go for a you know a glass of wine with your girlfriends yeah. but you can yeah. have to do it virtually so so yeah. for us actually all of the companies that have have really got social media or social platforms or social networks as a core feature have have really had to step up um yeah. and and you know adapt uh, in, yeah. a po in a positive way actually yeah yeah, no, it's great. I mean, obviously, we've seen Zoom share price just skyrocket. Yeah. But yeah. anyone, I think that that can, that connects people together. I mean, you know, if if it's if it's mums who have just yeah. had a kid and desperate for someone else to talk about what they're going through and stuff yeah. like that, it's super interesting. Um, it's been a really important resource, I think, for 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 people not to feel alone and 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 isolated. So it's this, you know, greater reliance and. You know, use of virtual connectivity has has suddenly now become really really important yeah yeah it's been one of the great things like for, for it's only for technologies a lot of bad aspects of social media that people talk about but the, the, yeah. the fantastic thing is this bringing people together during these kind of times and i think we're lucky that you know we've been locked down in 2020 i mean mm. you know 10 years ago it would have yeah. been a whole different experience you know. And I think that extends even to to things beyond social networking, right? I mean, I was listening to radio this morning, and and they were saying you know, companies are saying things like, "Oh, wow, we've finally realized that this technology does work, and we can actually work remotely." And I think that it, it's taken a global pandemic for some of these behaviors to really set in, and for us to to be forced to adapt to yeah. you know, whether it be more flexible working arrangements whether it be, you know, investing in a company without meeting the person in, you know, face to face. And I think a lot of these are actually quite positive uh, trends. Yeah, I think so. I think as long as everyone gets choice, because because a lot yeah. of people I speak to, um, for whatever reason, they, they want to go into the office. Yeah. Like they want the, the human contact, the interaction. Um, others don't, or others want a little bit of a mix. Yeah. So it's been really interesting to speak to um, to different companies and how they're structuring their workforces and office spaces and all of that kind of stuff. I'm excited to see kind of what comes out of it. Yeah, and uh, I think a big a big factor is do you have kids at home or not? You know, so I think yeah. that the um, people with kids, it's you know going to the office is a is it's an ability to to focus and be in a different environment. So I think that you say it exactly right, there needs to be choice. But I think what's great about this period is that it's showed, it's finally demonstrated to managements of companies that you can get around it. And yeah. hey, how about we introduce more flexible working arrangements, which it's gotta be a good thing. 100%, yeah. And a yeah. lot of the people that were, were against it, I've spoken to, are loving it now. Converts, I mean, yeah. They are, I mean, they like never used to use Microsoft Teams or Zoom or whatever. Yeah. And, and I was speaking to an HR director uh, a few weeks ago and the uptick of users on her Microsoft Teams was like, you know, crazy. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's a well, it's, it's, it's a good trend to have kind of, to have fast forwarded. But the, the other side to it is that working from home right now doesn't really mean work-life balance. Because like you're finding people roll out of bed into their office, yeah. doing most more work than they were before, and people are, are not respecting the kind of like working hours, let's say, and then and then you go back to bed. And I heard kind someone of... say that it's it's no longer working from home. It's it's uh what was it? It's it's you're basically home at work the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. It, it's gone the other way. So I think that's something I also struggled with at the beginning was creating boundaries and structures and routine. And I've got better at it over the course of the last you know, four months. Um, yeah. But 
I think that was definitely an adjustment that people had to make, which was really yeah. marking when is work time and when is home home time. Yeah, yeah. I've kept my diary as structured as, as I would do if I was coming into the office. Yeah. Because, you know, someone wants to do a call with me at 9, 9 p.m. I mean, they know at home. I'm not going out. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, you know, you don't have a, I don't know, an excuse, but it's, it's yeah. been a bit harder to just be like, actually, no, that's my exercise time or my family yeah. time. So yeah, you've got to you've got to draw some boundaries, I think. That took me a bit of time. Yeah. I wanted I wanted to also have a chat to you about diversity on boards. Yeah. Um, especially in, in tech where mm -hmm. um that there's typically less women and but what what are you like what are you seeing and so for me I think it's boards is is one part of it, but for me, stepping back, I think what's most important is that you see equal representation across all layers of uh, the ecosystem. And I can speak more personally about what I've seen on the early stage side of things, early yeah. stage technology or in venture capital. And so, as I said, look, I think it's really important that it's not just one aspect like boards or founders. I think that it needs to be equal representation for ethnic minorities and women across all stages of that. Um, and, and if you look at what, where we are at the moment in, in Europe and UK, you know, 92% of venture capital funding goes to all male teams and okay. around 80% goes to all uh, white teams, um, which to me is completely staggering given that, wow. you know, I'm in the industry and I see just the breadth of, of talent across all different uh, types of backgrounds. Um, so do you so see then, sorry to interrupt, do, do you see, yeah. do you see more, um, more male teams and more all white teams present opportunities ideas to you guys or are you seeing an equal number is it just yeah I mean for me I this is why I, I find a bit of a disconnect because I don't see that there is at least in the companies I make uh, I meet with I find there to be quite a good mix um, of people from all types of different backgrounds I mean perhaps I, I don't know if that's correlated that I am a female and an ethnic minority mixed race but um for me, there is there is just no excuse for for this skew to be ninety percent all male and eighty percent white. Um, and so I think you know to to your question of what can we do about this, it's for me. I think as I said, there needs to be representation across all different parts of the ecosystem. But I think also if you look at people around the decision making table when it actually comes to making the investment, you need yeah. to make sure that the decision makers are also representative because if they're going to surround themselves or invest in like-minded people to themselves, you wanna make sure that the diversity begins at the investment stage. So I actually yeah. turn it to the VCs themselves, to the venture capital firms and say, you know, it, I think at the moment in the UK, again, it's something like only 30% of, of UK VCs have female partners. Or um, and I think again around eighty percent don't have um, have ethnic minorities um, who are who are at the decision table. And so for me, if we can begin to correct the the people around the decision making table, that's going to filter through into yeah. I would hope into all different uh, parts, including boards. And you know the, the quickest way to become a board member is to be a VC and invest in one of those companies. I mean I sit on around five six boards and you know, I am female and I would be classified as an ethnic minority. So yeah. I think that um, it's got to also, you know, the venture capital firms also need to be quite accountable and very conscious about how they're actually structuring their investment teams um, yeah. to be less less male and less white. Yeah. And so that will then really stem down to their recruitment policy, uh, who they spend yeah. time with. I mean, there's a lot of aspects and I probably a lot of it is and maybe I'm being quite kind here, but probably a lot of it's unconscious bias. I'd imagine that could play a role. I think that, you know, I'm curious what, what you've seen from other guests and, and in your work, but things like blind hiring, I imagine could be effective redacting the name from CVs. I think one thing that people have been very focused on moving away from in venture capital is this idea of a warm introduction. So for a long time, there was this kind of perception that to be a successful entrepreneur, to get an introduction to VC, you would, to a venture capital firm, you should be recommended by someone that you know. And unfortunately, that just encourages more of the same. It's encouraging more of the same group of people to recommend their friends. And it's this kind of uh, circle that we get stuck in. So one of the things that I try to be very conscious about is not 
relying too much on those warm introductions. You're never going to stop them. There are a lot of good reasons why you have warm introductions. People love entrepreneurs and they might want to recommend them. But I think it is also important to make sure that you're looking beyond that and reading your cold emails, like reading your DMs that you get on Twitter. And <laughs> I think that you just have a call with someone if they've got a great idea and they've got a, con a convincing personal story. You don't yeah. need a warm introduction to, to qualify that. But you're probably one of very few that have that, that mindset. And it's a great mindset to have. But you can, yeah. remember, I mean, I guess, you know, VCs and PE firms, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll put them in together. Yeah. Have so many contacts of people pitching ideas, you know, wanting to meet them. A lot of a lot of them just don't have the time, I guess. I mean, it's not an excuse, but this is what I hear. And and the warm introduction, um, for sure. I mean, it, it goes on like all too mm -hmm. often. And I also think, I mean, warm introductions also should be diverse. So it's, you know, it's I, I think it, it's just again about having diversity around the investment team and decision makers at the table that are, are diverse yeah. um because then they have their own to... diverse networks exactly and then you're we... getting warm introductions but they're from their own networks and they may be different to the ones that we've typically seen which statistics show have favored white men yeah but then you can use other people also to introduce entrepreneurs yeah you know, like there's a lo loads of loads of networks that one can tap into yeah. um and so I think there's a great ecosystem that I think that yeah. I, you know, I encourage, you know, all founders, uh, but, but particularly ethnic minority or female founders to really take advantage of, um, you know, sign up to these different networks, go to these different events. And there should be people like myself who are investors who are really looking into in those ponds for, for the next founders they're going to back. Yeah. Yeah. So really network like hell. Get <laughs> yeah. And I, I, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean in person, obviously, at the moment, that's another thing no. that we've had to, to to contest with, which is there are ways to do it virtually. And look, yeah. if you're a mom, a single mom at home and you, you've got responsibilities, you can't just go to every networking event, which is why I think virtual platforms are really important as well um, yes. to either find a mentor or to join a conversation of like minded people and and be more efficient with your time. Because, again, look. Let's look at the structural reasons as well why um, you know it's more difficult perhaps for a single mother to to go out and network than you know a fresh grad uh, out of university who's male and doesn't have uh, these these commitments. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. That's true. I think yeah. going back to hiring, you mentioned blind CVs and and stuff. I mean, yeah, from from my role as a headhunter, there's a lot of companies that do yeah, that. You tell me the answer. I yeah. feel like you must have uh, you must I, have experimented with this at least. So much stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of things, right? So it's it's right down to even what the hiring manager is asking for. Do they mm -hmm. even know what they want? Yeah. Um, the, the way they the way they communicate it, the way they write the job description, the mm -hmm. language that they use that can put people on or off. Um, what's the company marketing like? You know, if yeah. if, if and if a single mum, for example, wants to apply for a role and they look at the website, is something putting them off about it? So, so yeah, it needs to be pervasive. It needs to be at every, yeah. uh, there's no detail that's too small, I think, in, yeah. in making sure you're being consciously um, anti some of these biases. Yes, yeah. And then it's then attracting people, right? How do you go mm -hmm. find them? So yeah. warm introductions, um, yeah. job ads, headhunters, you know, all, all of those different avenues. You need to make sure again that you're sourcing from as wide a pool as possible. So yeah. often, when when um, if we, we talk about P and VC, they all want someone from a tier one investment bank, probably an MBA. These these kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. Like quite a traditional um, background. And yeah. there are some fantastic people. So you know, let's say you're born into a low socioeconomic background, mm -hmm. um, you're much less likely to have made the right. GCC choices to make to get the right A-levels to get to the right university mm -hmm. to be able to go and into an MBA so I think also companies need to be open to people from different educational backgrounds as well you know, I, I agree people. look my dad is a as I said is a massive hero of mine and I think my dad got expelled from at least two schools that he went to <laughs> Uh, because he's, you know, he's always been uh, an entrepreneur and he he did end up going to university half-heartedly because his parents really wanted him to, but he was barely there and he dropped out the first one as well. So, you know, I think perhaps 
you know, I don't consider, um, you know, despite the fact that I have done quite traditional, I have taken quite traditional educational paths uh, myself, I don't necessarily rule out um, people that haven't come from that path. I think yeah. if I did, then I wouldn't admire my my dad in the, in the way that I did. And, and the fact yeah. that he's always, always forged his own path. Uh, yeah. I think in some ways, some investors look to that even more favorably because one of the things you look for in in entrepreneurs is resilience and the ability to to find a way to get things done and and typically actually going to do an MBA somewhere like Harvard to to use myself an example is not always doesn't always necessarily show um, the types of of qualities that you're only looking for in a founder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's important. And, and what you what I find also is that people that are going through that journey, that they may not have the right A-levels and stuff, they feel often like they're not going to be able to get the funding. They're not going to be able to build that business. And and yeah. so maybe they're not dreaming big enough or they've not seen someone tread the path they want to go down. Yeah, which um, again, as I think about, therefore having investors at the table who maybe aren't just from this cookie cutter background. Um, yeah. And I know that the US, there are a lot of initiatives at the moment at some of the big VCs in America that are um, putting a lot, placing a lot more emphasis on teams that are from uh, much more diverse backgrounds than than this, I guess, I keep using this cookie cutter type yeah. example. Yeah, yeah. I think we're, we're well, I say it feels like we're getting there, but I think we're so, so, so far to go still. You've um, got to help us. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm doing my best. If I, if I, yeah. yeah. We need I mean, it. We, the ground I mean, up. we have, uh, you know, I mean, my, my team is really diverse. And, you know, then the, for the way that we source, you know, kind of mi mirrors the diversity so, of, our, yeah. um, of our company. So, we're trying. I feel I feel like Europe is a little bit further ahead than the US right now. But again, you know, it's difficult to really to really tell and get under the skin. I think I think it's hard to just simply say ahead. I just, there's so many different different categories and layers that you could go into. But I I, I don't think either are doing as well as they should be. Put it no. that way. A long way. <laughs> a long way to go well we'll do our best thank you um thank you so much for speaking to me it's been it's been great of to speak course. to you and i'm sorry and that you, you, uh, yeah next time we'll do it in in your studio in person yeah. we'll do face to face definitely great well great to see you and yeah. uh speak soon you. bye thank then. you see ya